So yeah, that's what I'm, I'm hoping people go, what the F? <laughs> I, I think you nailed it. Cause I think that is I what think we that's were exactly doing. what happened. And, <laughs> and here I am one week later being mm-hmm. like, Evo, 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 <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> everyone, and welcome back to After Broadway, the podcast where we deep dive into anything and everything musical theater. I'm Tara. I'm Stefania. And in today's episode, we're joined by one of the cast members from the new original musical, Dion, a rock opera. Please welcome Jacob McInnes to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Congratulations on the show. We saw it opening night um, and the energy in the room was so amazing. Honestly, it's some of our favorite things to do to see things on opening nights because the energy is always so, so fun. Um, So we're really excited to talk to you today and hear all about the show. Awesome. Yeah, openings are so electric. (laughs) They are. Um, But before we get into the show, we always start our episodes by asking, what is your earliest memory of theater? Mm, ooh, good question. Um, well, I was like, I was, I had that family who, where I was rocked to sleep by like, do you hear the people sing from Les Mis? <laughs> and uh, I was exposed to all like the Andrew Lloyd Webbers, of course, growing up. But I think the first live thing I remember just being like blown away by, I had a babysitter in, I think grade one or two, and she was in a high school production of West Side Story. And I had seen the movie before, but I saw it live and I thought, oh my God, that's something that I have to do. And uh, so I, I fell in love with it there. And then my dad randomly, who was the most, sh- he was the shyest person in the entire world. He was taking vocal lessons and his teacher was a uh, an actor and he kind of bullied him into being, in a production of uh, Blood Brothers at the Whippy Courthouse Theater. And so I think for some courage, he brought me uh, with him to rehearsals. And that was kind of the first time I got to interact with theater people. And I thought, oh my gosh, like they're here are these adults, men and women together, changing in the same room and treating me, you know, this like nine year old, like I was an adult. And that I think that's what really bit me. I love that. The Whippy Courthouse, what even is that theater? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's where they used to keep all the criminals in Whippy, which <laughs> that's apropos. Uh, yeah. And now uh, they converted it into this lovely little community theater. Wow. <laughs> I wonder, do you do you still know this babysitter that you went to see? Or does she know kind of the influence that, that she had on your life? No, I don't think so. Cause we really, we kind of took care of ourselves mostly growing up. So I think we had her like once or twice and she brought a bunch of games. That's all I remember. It was really exciting. But uh, her, I think her name was Andrea. Anyway, if you're listening, Andrea. Shout out. <laughs> Loved you in West Side Story. <laughs> Um, I'm just also I'm imagining like an, a Whitby production of West Side Story being slightly. It was like a Whitby high school. Cool production. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> even better. Even better. Yeah. Um, amazing. Okay, so now let's get back to Dion. So this is a brand new piece of theater um, based on, I'm going to try and pronounce this, um, The Bakai by Euripides. Did I do it? Yeah, yeah, The Bakai. Okay. Yeah. The ba- yeah. okay, okay. Uh, which pre- premiered in 405 BC. So for those not familiar with this story, can you give a little bit of a synopsis for what Dion is about? Sure. I'll give, yeah, I'll just give kind of like a, the general lead up to the events of the show. So mm-hmm. kind of in this version, it focuses on Dion or Dionysus, uh, who is uh, half God, half mortal, uh, whose father is Zeus and mother is uh, a mortal woman named Semele. And uh, Semele is, uh, sees the face of Zeus and is struck down and killed and Dion is kind of planted into Zeus's thigh and is born from Zeus's thigh. So is this kind of God of rebellion and lust and wine and um, their mother's sister, Agave, uh, and her tyrannical son, Pentheus, now uh, run the city of Thebes and are dastardly people. And they are besmirching Dion 
Jan's mother's name and saying that she in fact didn't uh, see Zeus, she kind of slept around with another mortal and they're kind of uh, slandering her name. So Dion returns to Thebes to exact revenge and uh, kind of does it by way of letting all the women in the downtrodden of the city escape the city and uh, participate in these Bacchic orgies and dances and uh, kind of festivals of liberation. And uh, yeah, and hilarity ensues. <laughs> Had you heard of the original work before this production was in play? I had never heard of this I, before. <laughs> no, I had never heard of the Bacchus in particular, but like I, I, I'm obsessed with Greek mythology. So, you know, I knew about Zeus and of course, yeah. you know, Hercules. And, uh, and I knew about Dionysus. Uh, I think, I think Dionysus makes an appearance in like Disney's Fantasia as this like fat god <laughs> who's like stomping, stomping grapes and like riding around like a drunk. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's kind of like that's all really I knew of it. I was more I I kind of we were taught more of uh, um, Oedipus, mm. like that kind of Greek theater. But this is a lot more. It's it's not done as often because it's it right. is so strange. <laughs> uh, but I love learning about it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's what kind of made it the perfect thing to adapt, though, I think, in this form, because it's so different from a traditional Greek tragedy. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it's really dangerous. And it's really, um, it doesn't have the, a satisfying ending, really. It, it kind of leaves you I, in the spirit of tragedy, it leaves you kind of with this open wound. <laughs> and thinking about uh, about life and, and its themes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's go back in time a little bit. When did you first hear about this project? So I was called by Diana from the Coal Mine Theater, and she said that uh, Ted, her partner uh, and co-owner of Coal Mine Theater, Ted Dykstra, who is an incredible theater writer, was writing uh, a rock opera based on this Greek myth. <laughs> and she kind of, she asked about, I had just recently uh, kind of come out as non-binary online and uh, they, they thought, wow, here's this God who's half man, half woman. Um, and they knew I, I was a, a singer and, uh, and a performer. And so they, yeah, they reached out. And it was so funny, she said, you know, there are some themes in this that we need to make sure you're okay with. <laughs> and luckily, uh, you know, I'm not easily shakable. I, I like, I love the world of Game of Thrones. I love do or die. I love, I'm just like, okay, incest, throw it at me. Like, <laughs> murder, easy. Love it. Uh, and then, and then from there, we, uh, we workshopped it twice. We've been doing this since, uh, I think October of 2021 was our first workshop of the show mm -hmm. and wow. one other and then the production. So talking about working with Ted and Diana, we actually sat next to them at opening night. We were like, oh, look at that. Next, right next to us. <laughs> um, Ted composed the music for the show and both of the co finders of Coal Mine Theater. You kind of had the rare opportunity to spend time with them like right from the beginning of development. What, if anything, has changed in that whole development process from that first workshop to that second workshop to even this rehearsal process? Well, first and foremost, um, it's been a total joy working with Diana and Ted um, and getting to know them kind of as friends uh, and colleagues. Um, I call Diana the it girl. I find her just the nicest, coolest person so ever. And Ted, like, she is so she. So I literally say, hey, it girl. She is so awesome. <laughs> and she's really, really passionate. And, and we share that quality as well uh, with Ted. Um, Ted is a very, very, very passionate person. Um, and he never won't tell you what he feels. <laughs> and as an Aries, I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and, and he's just uber talented. And I think they, they make the perfect combination like fire and water. Um, and I mean, the things they've produced at coal mine have been world-class. Like it is just like one hit after another hit after another. Um, and the imagination they have to turn that black box, 
space into into like incredibly different worlds. Like each show is a, is just like a new experience. And so I knew we'd be in really good hands with, with this show. And in terms of how it's changed, I mean, it's really grown. It, it has changed a lot. Um, new songs have been added. Uh, I think an element that helped it along was having Peter Hinton there, uh, the director from the start, and who like, I could sit and listen to Peter talk for hours, and I have, um, <laughs> about Greek theater, about history, about mythology. It's like all the stuff that I nerd out over YouTube um, about. And uh, uh, so his um, input has been incredible. And then of course, having actors in the room, um, like Dion used he, him pronouns at the beginning. And because, I, and I, I said, hey, why don't we try to, you know, honor their uh, non-binary duality and try they, them pronouns. And so that built, um, and of course, just with, with having people inhabit the roles, you see, you see little things that they'll try and you go, oh, let's go towards that direction. And like a, a Agave, um, Pentheus' mom has a new song and kind of concerning the relationships between the other characters that I know, I guess in the Bakai, uh, Agave is kind of just like a secondary character who just comes in at the end and rips her son's head off. <laughs> There's not really a lot um, mentioned of her. So it's nice to see more kind of like a window into their, their minds and their world. So it, it's changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. This is Coal Mine Theater's first world premiere developed and produced right here at home. It's 44 years in the making. Does that feel a little like pressure? Do you feel pressure from that? Do you feel excited to be a part of that? Like what goes through your mind when you think of like, this is a, a world premiere of such like, an original piece. Hmm. Well, luckily, I've I've um, I've been able to be a part of some some new works uh, in my um, in my career. Um, I went to Sheridan College, and uh, Sheridan's a huge hub for developing new work. Um, I believe I've done a couple uh, premieres at Young People's Theatre in Toronto. So mm -hmm. so I kind of know know the deal. I mean, this one's different because it's literally called Dion the Rock Opera and I am <laughs> playing Dion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I think because I have been part of the DNA of it for a good chunk of time, the material has really sat inside of me. And I think me and the character just kind of through exploration and through me being in Dion's shoes have melded into you know something that's fresh and new that i've brought to it so i feel i feel partly like a contributor which is exciting and makes it less like am i doing okay <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so it's exciting more than anything and this show is definitely taking a lot of risks from the staging to the subject matter as an audience member who happens to be a frequent theater goer, it's exciting to see a show that is kind of veering in a different direction from what we're usually expecting. Um, so it's exciting for me. Does it feel that way as a cast member as well to be doing something different than typical or no? Yeah, it's um, it's uh, wild. The whole process was wild. I mean, I had never worked with Peter Hinton before, before these workshops and I had heard about him and uh, you know read about productions he'd done. Uh, and I know he works a lot in opera and he does a lot of uh, LGBTQIA plus um, flavored material. And uh, and then of course the subject matter is, is so like, whoa, <laughs> like it really, it, it, it doesn't get done much. So that uh, that to do is really exciting. I will say through the process, we we really uh, leaned into the operatic nature of it and the the tragedy, the Greek tragedy, and that's something I hadn't done. I'm usually from the ha, 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 musical theater um, <laughs> world, and so us and this too, is very I us too, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, chits and teeth, right? Um, <laughs> so this is the same, but a, a little different. <laughs> There's some claws in there, uh, but. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I'm a huge fan of Game of Thrones. And so um, I like to go to theater to be like, oh, to clutch my pearls. 
And, uh, you know, although it, it's, I think it's uh, approached in a really kind of reserved way. Like, you know, there's orgies and stuff, but no one's naked. Like everyone's mm -hmm. fully clothed in these really dope costumes by Scott Penner. It's sexy without being, uh, it's more suggestive than anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I find that way sexier. Um, uh, while we're on the train of costumes, did you all have input on your costumes? Like how did that work? Cause obviously like the, we'll call them the Greek chorus is wearing like written words all over their body. It kind of looks like everyone kind of had their own influence on that. Is that true? Well, I think it was definitely a collaboration. I mean, it mostly comes from Scott Penner, the, sure. the designer, uh, and of course working really closely with Peter Hinton, the director and uh, observing us in rehearsal. Cause a lot of like that chorus of four, mm -hmm. they had to build that from scratch, uh, mm -hmm. all their personas. And they have to dip in and out of different, being different people, playing yeah. different roles, uh, and then being like a cohesive amoeba. And so these kind of individual personalities of each four arise, like Sasha's this kind of warrior and Caden's more of this like studious, just like different personalities started to come out. And so I think Scott, in communication with each person talking about okay what are your what do you do in the show like what do you need to have like do you need arms do you want arms off okay puffer jacket that'll get hot let's put a loop so it kind of hangs off the back like um and then i think watching them they kind of got what they needed to to write on those coats it's, it's amazing you can like i can get caught for hours just kind of looking at what Reading. they've written it's, it, it's so uh and it's not just like words 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 it's everything has a meaning it's pretty yeah. it's pretty incredible but the one that stuck uh, out the most I mean, was the evo all over the clothes obviously if you've seen the show then you'll know what that is <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah for for those we've had yeah we've had that, that. all be on the podcast before, so we knew her like a little bit. So her outfit, I was like, oh, that fits kind of what we know of her so well, which is already like, oh, I wonder if it like fits each person's personality or if they were had that influence. And then for you, your show shopping costume for me is that gold gown at the end that you kind of like are covered and then reveal that gold gown. Like, does it feel powerful to like walk out wearing that? Yeah, well, <laughs> like uh, Scott being so amazing. Actually, Scott and I worked together, we did, uh, the Rocky Horror Show 10 years ago in Sudbury. Wow. And I just remember feeling so sexy in that costume. So when I found out he was doing it, I was very pumped because I knew it was a sexy show and I, I wanted to feel good and confident. Uh, so when I found out he did it, I said, okay, I'm comfortable with showing my boobs. <laughs> Do it that as you will. And, uh, and so we had a meeting prior to starting rehearsal and he said, hey, can I show you some of the designs? And he had gone in and like gone through all my Instagram, looking at my style, looking at what tattoos I had, looking at like every, putting into consideration every haircut I've ever had and kind of put these looks together and it felt like he had crawled into my brain and just nailed right on the head exactly how I want to, to look in the world. Um, I love being hyper-masculine sometimes. I love leaning into the feminine and the kind of like gender queer and fluidity. Um, there was a point where I had three costumes. I think there are some production stills where my old costumes in it. I noticed, yes. Um, Cause like now I start to show- one of the, one yeah. of the production stills. I was like, where, I didn't see that. <laughs> where was that? <laughs> That's my Rihanna Met Gala. <laughs> um, I, I did one of the shows in it and I, and Peter, the director came to me and said, what if we just do that second look and start that way? Because, it's kind of this really grounded, masculine, um, in the same vocabulary, the visual vocabulary as the chorus. So it's kind of like, you know, Jesus and his followers. It's a, I'm already one of them. And and then that makes the reveal to this like fricking, you know, Glenn Close Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> God of theater, like one boob out. It, I mean, the, and Every I think glitter. it just, <laughs> yeah, just poured in glitter. I think that makes the reveal just like that much yeah. more satisfying. 
and uh, and lets me live in that. It's kind of like okay, like everything's loose, everything's kind of you know I'm wearing heavy boots in the first, so it kind of inspires how I act. And then of course I'm in a corset, so I'm a lot more upright and slinky and feel like seductive and all that. So it really Scott's amazing. It does the costumes do a lot of work for me. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about this space a little bit. We saw Yerma at Coal Mine last year. And to think that we were in that space and this space this year, and it's the same place is wild. Um, this has those two statues on the ends, the red catwalk. And then um, there was a quote from your director, Peter, that said, it's not a museum piece, stretch of the imagination. It's a trip. And it's really exciting to see a big splashy musical in a very intimate space. Do you feel that way as well? Yeah, it's wild. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I love it. There's just so much, you could see the show multiple times and get something new just by where you're sitting in this, in the space. Mm -hmm. Um, it's cool that the, all the action of the show happens between Adonis, which, which is like this ultimate male image iconography and then Venus, this ultimate female iconography but their backs are turned and they're looking at themselves in mirrors and they're pondering themselves. And I always kind of thought, as we finished the show, I thought, wow, this really isn't like any musical. It feels more like an, an experience, almost like a, like a live art thing. And so I thought it just, it, it's so cool that it almost takes place in this museum. Um, style atmosphere there's like bloody red runway i don't know it's it's <laughs> i don't know how scott thought of it and peter but it's um it's wild it's, and especially with bonnie beecher's lighting it's like lighting. the space totally transforms it's wild and it's so, like to the inch it's such specific lighting so it almost feels like you're in this like fever dream uh I know being in it, that's what it feels like. <laughs> I am always looking for lighting in shows and the light rods, like the lightsabers basically <laughs> that the chorus is using, incredible. But the one that I love the most, there's it, it's used twice. It's like a spotlight that almost has like a filter that's cut out. So it looks like that prison cell. It's like, I've never seen a spotlight look like that before. And it was used so effectively when like you're on one side and I think Pantheus is on the other side and it's just like smoke and spotlight. I, the lighting was a character to me, which was so exciting. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's so cool to have an artist like Bonnie who is story-based I heard someone say that Bonnie lights people, not sets. Mm. And yeah. like each lighting cue is made with Peter and, and she comes in and she observes, observes, observes the story, goes through the story. What's And uh, that moment in particular, I love it too. I, I'm always like, oh God, am I in the right spot? Am I in the right spot? <laughs> Cause it's just like red bricks. You're like, I don't know which brick I'm on. I hope it's the right one. Cause there's no, there's no um, spikes on the floor. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, it, you have to be in the exact right spot. Someone, I, I read a, I read a, an article that said that that moment, it looks like we were like being chosen as like video game character. <laughs> <laughs> choose <Okay>. your player <laughs> but you guys it's like super jump dope. into like, different costumes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's like i want mine to be old come back <laughs> uh, but kind of the cool thing too like there's a really awesome lighting moment at the very end with pentheus and his mom mm, and yes i guess we were trying to figure out how, <laughs> how we, were we, we were we were trying to figure out how we were doing it i was like it's lighting it's lighting he's just <laughs> Spoiler alert, spoiler, he's just dressed in black and lying on the ground. <laughs> yeah. It took us like a minute. I, I was like, wait, how are they doing that? It's so wild. It's so wild what you can do with lighting. Like so, some people be like, okay, let's do like a cast of your head and we're going to do gore and all that. But Bonnie just goes, nope, we'll put a light on you that looks like you're drained of all blood and have two very skilled actors just bring it together with Peter. Like it, and I get to stand at the very and watching this whole thing happen it's just like <laughs> it's like i'm at a show i'm like oh fuck, i'm in the show 
<laughs> it was super That's effective saying. for yeah, sure. It was, it was, like yeah. that, I think I turned to Steph when it happened. I was like, whoa. Like I didn't even know what else to say, but just whoa. But that also kind of like, we, as you were saying earlier about the, like where you sit kind of would be different every single time. Like we were lucky to sit like dead center basically. And I had seen an article say that it's almost because so much happens on either side of the stage that it's like a tennis match. You're like watching everything happen because we are like the trial. And then Steph and I were talking just before we jumped on here of like watching your fellow audience members reactions because we're looking at them is something effective too. So it's it's a really interesting setup for such a small space. Mm. What what I was not to interrupt, but what I was saying was Greek Greek shows were, were put on in these amphitheaters, Greek plays were put on these amphitheaters, and in the background would be the Greek town and it cast, you know, the characters in the play as members of the town. And similarly to seeing this, because it's somewhat in the round and the backdrop to the show is the other half of the audience members, it casts the other audience members as like members of your cult or followers of Pentheus. And I think it's added so much to the story that uh, you were all telling. And I thought that set design, that lighting design just like nailed it. Also the balloon popping. <laughs> this is just where we eat fan out. This is just where we, we tell you what we love. <laughs> we were, I, I had read the trigger warning of balloon popping, but I did not expect it when it happened. <laughs> so cool. when peter i remember in rehearsal when when peter's like we're gonna launch a i think it's like 100 balloons or something mm -hmm. like that i thought okay <laughs> cool like <laughs> you know but then like these red balloons that turn into gunfire and with the, the lighting chorus, like the chorus going in and out of being cops and being victims like <sighs> I mean, I, I like I said, I get to sit, stand and watch it, and watching the four of them do that is so uh, it, it's really affecting. I, I think one, I think I actually it was probably opening night, and I was you know really in in the in the zone, and and that first balloon pop like really made me shake, and I <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it makes you think like it's just it's um, Peter is a genius. And to, to have you go, okay, we have four people do a police demonstration, like do do a, a protest and then an arrest of an entire mob. You're like, okay, pff, good luck. Yeah. And it's, it's brilliant. I mean, and then there's like the, the pop. I saw one night like Max uh, Borowski did it against his chest and then this gush of of red balloon popped balloon like shot out and it looked like blood and it was just like oh my god this is wild they're they're such a hard-working ensemble the four of them they are they are on stage that whole show they're the heroes i mean they honestly they have the toughest job and they do it so well and they they did the whole process with such grace because they it it was really, it's easy, you know, when you're a principal, you have your lyrics, you have your your storyline, you know what your character's doing, but they had to create everything. And so Kira Sangster, who did associate directing and um, a lot of the choreography and movement uh, kind of with the chorus, uh, I mean, it was, I got to be in the room for a lot of it and it was, it was watching <laughs> masters of their craft. It, it is a bit of a different use of the Greek chorus. A lot of time in a Greek chorus, they're outside of the action, but this time they are the action. They are being influenced by every character. So again, really like fun ways that the show like took the, you know, the Greek play and like turned parts of it on its head or reinterpreted it for what we are seeing and for this modern, this modern time. And they, they were like a huge part of that for me, the Greek, the, this Greek chorus, this ensemble. Mm -hmm. Agree. Um, we do have a bit of a game for you. Since we've been talking about Dion, we thought we would put you to the test to see how well do you really know Dion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're stressed. <laughs> this is from a very official <laughs> quiz website, so maybe it's not completely correct. But we'll find out. Um, okay, first question. Dion was the god of what? Wine and theater. But there's okay. also... there's. There's different versions too. There's like revelry, there's um, uh, anarchy, there's, anyway. But God of Wine and Theater is. <laughs> um, you are correct. Okay, next question. Dion's most sacred animal was? I can give you options, unless you know. 
Give me a multiple choice. <laughs> okay. The party wolf, the leopard, the elephant, or the groundhog? Oh, the leopard. Correct. Yeah. I've seen those so art pieces. Mm. <laughs> okay, number three. True or false? Dion was the only god to have a mortal mom. Mmm. False. It's oh, true. Wait. True. Because there are demigods mm -hmm. who have mortal parents, but Dion specifically is a half god, half mortal. There's like a cast of gods. I was told this by Peter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Strike it from the record. The hierarchy of the gods. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've already gone over this, but one more time. Who were Dion's parents? Oh, Semele and Zeus. Yes. Correct. Number five, true or false, theater going was strictly for entertainment. False. Correct. Yeah. This It says here, um, their festivals were for enjoyment, worship, business, serious discussion, and much more. Mm-hmm. Um, number six, who struck Dion with madness, causing him to wander around the earth? Oh. I can give you options. Zeus? <laughs> no. Hmm. Incorrect. Kyra? No. <laughs> Tell me. The other options here are Hera, Hades, or Poseidon. Oh, oh, maybe Hera because it's Zeus's wife. Correct. Yeah. She's yes. she's jealous. She gets real jealous, but I like don't do not blame her. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Like it makes sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, number seven, what group of women followed Dion around the world encouraging the cult? Oh, the, the Bacchae, the, ba the Bacchanalians. It's not women, that, like but I agree that it's that. I would also like to read the options here are believers, fangirls, oh <laughs> Americans, which I think is a short form for Americans. And then the answer, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Mayonnaise? Oh yeah, Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise? Right. Yeah. Them. Yeah, Mayonnaise. Okay, great. Plus the, the believers, final, obviously. Plus the believers, believers. yeah. <laughs> yeah, final answer, believers. Believers. <laughs> Um, and then the final question here, true or false, the main ads were wild women who were drunkards. Like, yeah. Yes, they were. Yes, yeah. they were. <laughs> Hell yeah, they were. Because <laughs> they were known for their wild and ecstatic behavior. Yeah, And they engaged yeah. in frenzy dances, rituals, and celebrations, often accompanied by heavy drinking. Which, I mean, yeah. god of theater and wine, what more would you expect than entertainment and heavy drinking, right? <laughs> Can I tell you the funniest thing ever? Please. Yes. <laughs> I I don't like I th the irony is not lost on me that the year I got sober is the year I played the god of wine. Oh, what? Um, <laughs> oh. Yeah, on the 15th is my 4 month uh, officially of sobriety. Congratulations. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> And here you are singing about drinking wine <laughs> and yeah. then influencing everyone mm -hmm. to yeah, into a I cult of wine. Yeah. <laughs> like, do it on my behalf, please. Yeah. Um, but I certainly have had my Bacchanalian days, <laughs> like, days. my Dionysian years. <laughs> That's my 20s. <laughs> Um, something that we have not talked about at all here is the rock opera aspect of this show. Um, rock operas aren't really done so much these days. I feel like when I was watching this, I was like, oh, I'm getting Jesus Christ Superstar vibes. I'm getting like Tommy vibes. Um, mm -hmm. There are earworms from this production. I've been like humming the like Dion, my God, Dion for days. Um, and yeah, what does it feel like to do like a song through musical? I feel like it's so much. And because this is seven minutes in remission, you're kind of like on that ride until you're not. Yeah, I mean, I love it. My my uh, my comfort zone is singing for sure. Um, I started singing before I, I acted. I mean, you're always acting through singing for sure. But but I'm I. I particularly love singing and I love 
I love Superstar. I love all those shows that are like, okay, you got to warm up your voice. You got to lay off the drinking. You got to drink your tea. You got to, you know, because um, really it's it's what that group of people, nine people are doing is, is athletics. And uh, it takes a lot of strict practice and and uh especially in that space like our diction has to be really great too so um to tell the story uh so i love it it's like this incredible challenge that i love to 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 raise to and um yeah it's it's a rush i freaking love it you're not wearing mics right no it sounded amazing in there yeah like bob foster is you know one of the top is is a Canadian treasure, uh, music music uh, for composing for for music direction, and you know an acoustic rock opera <laughs> is a tall order with mm -hmm. with I think it's only bass, simple percussion and keyboards, uh, and to get the sound that they can get in that space is incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. It, it sounds, it really does sound so full with all your voices, plus that like three person band. Um, I can't imagine where they would even put speakers or put microphones for it to mic you. So <laughs> like, it sounds wonderful. Um, speaking of the singing and the songs, do you have a song that you are looking forward to singing every night? Yeah, I love the song I sing at the very end uh, called Moment to Moment and it's kind of, it comes at a point where uh, I get to kind of take off the character Dion and just kind of sing as Jacob. Uh, and it's, I mean, the lyrics are, that's another one where I feel like Steve Mayoff's kind of crawled into my brain and exposed what goes on in there for people to see. And it questions, you know, what it means to be human and our obsession with trying to be godlike and trying to f find what the truth is um, while forgetting to just live in the moment. And it's anyway, it's it's very, very cathartic. And it, it's uh, I think it's like a really well suited song to to my to my voice. Mm -hmm. There's a little clip of it on Instagram posted by Cool Mind, like a one minute clip. So I was listening to that earlier today on repeat just to get back into the zone. It, it really is like a beautiful, yes. To, yeah. Let me hear Jacob again. No, it, it really is like a beautiful, beautiful like period on, on the whole piece. I thought it was really beautiful. Thank you. Time. And then kind of on the flip side of that, do you have a favorite song to watch from stage? Yeah, I mean, anything Sate sings is like, uh, going to church, like it's like a, a it's a holy experience. Uh, Say it as a as a per who plays Tiresias, who does the opening song, of course, and then the song kind of after Pentheus and I meet, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's so special. And Say as a person, she's uh, very spiritual she's a libra she's my sister sign and uh she's just wise 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 so like perfect casting and i just get to sit there and freaking listen i have to wait outside um before my first entrance out in the the stairwell of the coal mine <laughs> i i used to get so nervous like oh when do i when do i open the door and the second state starts singing i go okay here we are so it's uh that's what i look forward to i mean all of them are really really great uh but but states in particular i look forward to mm -hmm. um in the original play back to that um it is the woman who lived this to leave the society to follow dion but in this retelling it is expanded to not only women the queer community just uh, it expands to literally anyone who is feeling um disenfranchised with the original society like tell us about the importance of expanding uh, who who is drawn to the cult in this in this production? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the writers uh, were really inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, all this like really incredible social uh, change that happened while we were in lockdown. 
Um, and uh, of course, like we're still not done fighting for women's rights. Like it's like me too. It's over. It's like no. It's very much you know still something we have to focus on. But you know, uh, trans rights are very much in the the zeitgeist right now and uh, being threatened and and uh, uh, I think. I think it's it's good to see just a, a broader um, kind of group of of different people who who are still kind of outcast by society, um, but all all very you find in a lot of these movements they're very female led anyway, and uh, you know trans women are huge with uh, pushing culture and um, and uh, anyway so. I feel like women always, are always a part of it. And then, uh, yeah, there's more incredible people who need their voices heard now, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you've, you also mentioned that this story kind of changed when you came out as non-binary. Um, you're playing a non-binary character in this show and you are a non-binary performer. Do you ever feel that there's a responsibility with the roles that you take on? Um. I don't know. I mean, much like Dion, I kind of go moment to moment. Uh, the cool thing about Dion is, you know, they they're non-binary, but they're it's it feels like it's just like me inhabiting this this uh, this character, and I think it's great to see non-binary roles um, and. Uh, what I like about this one is that, you know, it's not just like this, like victim of like, Oh, I'm being misgendered and all that. It's, it's like, Oh no, they like are <laughs> sociopaths who like exact revenge. And it's like, it's like multiple people are capable of multiple things. And I think um, mm -hmm. sometimes in the conversation nuance can get lost. And so I just think it's really exciting seeing someone who's non-binary and also a vengeful fucking god who isn't a saint sure. uh and that's that's life I, I love it yeah i think it also speaks a lot to the ending of this show of you know everyone's kind of like following that cult but then you almost break it and you wonder if like things actually have changed and it kind of reminded me of just like the world that we live in today and it's like you know we can say all of this stuff but like are we actually moving in the right direction so i thought it was so interesting for the show to challenge that as like it's based on like a greek myth but told in such a modern way which really makes it relatable for today's theater community mm -hmm. yeah it's like it's you know, question who you put your faith in, uh, you know, um, it's the danger of single-minded thinking mm -hmm. uh, and a lack of balance and a lack of nuance. And I, I mean, like the thing is too, like the song, The Great Reclaiming, really it's the destruction of society is a great thing for nature. <laughs> And, you know, like you see with lockdown, like Venice, I think it was like fish were in the canal and deers were outside and it's like nature will be fine without us. So it's, it's like, uh, I, I just, yeah, I, I love how almost like the liberation of these people was just kind of collateral in Dion's fight for revenge it's a strange it's this strange like really nuanced thing of like but so many people were liberated but it led to like this, it's like, it really makes you go, oh my God, like who, who did I put all this faith in? And, and what is, what is true? And I, it's, there's something just so human about it. Mm -hmm. Like Dion's I, goal was just, just revenge, but everyone else found yeah. this like greater meaning in this. And like, sure, that's yeah. great. Like, so happy for you. But Dion's but like, I don't, I, I don't care <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's really like manipulative. It's quite, uh, it's a really juicy part to play. It's very cool. There was mm -hmm. like this, this kind of penny drop moment of, of the chorus being like, wait a minute. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I, that so, last moment at the end where the chorus is kind of 
uh, backing you up on your song and then they start chanting Evo again, I'm like, oh, <laughs> we're, we're right back at the start. We're from the beginning, again, which is, you know, a hallmark again of like a Greek tragedy that it's like doomed to repeat, but also, you know, fits, oh, have they found or, you know, did it, did it work or who even knows, but it, it does leave you thinking something. Mm -hmm. or, or even just where... plant a seed of mm -hmm. something, you know? It's like, it feels like almost the end of a doll's house, you mm. know, when, when Nora just like leaves and you're like, mm -hmm. are you going to be better? It, you know, but it's like you something know, little. Jesus. Yeah. You don't know, but, but, uh, and you know, I liked it. It's for, it's for you to think, I guess it's for the audience. Yeah. Too. Yeah. 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 Which kind of leads it's, to our, our guess, almost our last question is, as the audience is walking out and you know going onto the street, what do you hope that they're thinking about or taking away from from Dion? Great question. Yeah, just kind of what we're talking about, thinking like, oh god, what, like, what was the meaning? What was the what's the theme? Because I always go, okay, what was the theme here? And <laughs> and tragedy kind of does this thing where it's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. <laughs> it's it's an experience. So I'm more so hoping people are people go, what the fuck did I just see? <laughs> and then over the, the days go, huh? And and think about it as, as they're away from it. Because for me, I remember hearing it the first time I went, oh, and then I I would, you know, Evo, 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 or like Dion, 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 my God, Dion. And I'd be like, oh my God. And just, you know, think and think and think about it. So yeah, that's what I'm. I'm hoping people go, "What the f?" <laughs> I, I think you nailed it because I think that is. I what think we that's were exactly doing. what happened. And, and <laughs> here I am, one week later, being mm -hmm. like, "Evo, Evo, Evo!" <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> so I think term. you nailed it. I think you really nailed it. <laughs> yeah, and like, um, and like, maybe, maybe going like, oh, I should see it again. Mm -hmm. Like maybe maybe so I'll get something different this time because there is a lot of information. Else. Yeah, and sit well. somewhere else, which is a totally different experience. Yeah. Love that. Um, well, before we get to our obsessions, we do have another game for you. This is a rapid fire. It's called Personality Test Drive. Okay, so your road trip cast recording. What are you listening to? <gasps> oh, uh, <clears throat> original cast of Sweeney Todd. Wow, I feel like you went through a lot of emotions there when you were trying to figure that out. Yes, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you go in there, Sweeney Todd. If you're driving, if you're driving home, what do you what do you pop it in? Mm. Ooh, mm. <laughs> probably the film version of West Side Story. Okay. Ooh. Both, I mean, a Sondheim, a Sondheim, a Sondheim car ride in yeah. the house. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> okay, do you have a pre-show ritual? Yeah, I actually stole it from Canadian treasure, Jay Magis. I have some salt and vinegar chips Ooh, mm -hmm. and like a juice or like a Gatorade. Um, and I do my makeup and uh, vocal warm up. And then I check in with everyone in the cast and then we do our thing. Does the salt and vinegar like lubricate the vocal cords? Yeah, I think there's something about like the grease and like, you know, you I get feel like a couple... this is not the first time I've heard this. No. Yeah, I think, I think it's the grease. And if you have any like cobwebs in there, it kind of just like pushes it all down. I don't know. Right. It's, okay. it's, it works. Okay. And I have so like, I'm going to draw the time now because I'm gonna you know, like, it's just for my voice. <laughs> it's for my voice. <laughs> so, and Jay would always have a, an apple juice and a salt, Miss Vicky salt and vinegar, but I like covered bridge salt and vinegar. Oh, uh, fancy. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Um, a movie that you turn into a musical. Oh, okay. So a st I, I taught for a little bit acting tutorials at Sheridan College and my student Abby and I thought it would be so sick to see a stage musical of Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> I can't say we've heard that answer before. No, <laughs> we haven't, but you know what's funny? You know what we did hear? Dune. We heard Dune, which I feel like this is one in the yeah. same. <laughs> a desert, a yeah. desert set kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also heard holes. 
So whole know, people dude, are really mad sand. nuts, we love the sand. <laughs> yeah. That that or I always thought like, you know, terms of endearment would make mm. a beautiful like Jason Robert mm. Brown musical or like Steel Magnolias sure. would be beautiful. Sure. Yeah. Just like an adult dramedy kind of yeah. vibe. Um, okay. A favorite composer. Ooh, Lana Del Rey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for theater, yeah. <laughs> uh, hmm, that's a really good question because I like some Art. Sondheim things, but I have to say I like Andrew Lloyd Webber. Wow! Wow! I know, I know, that's the first controversial, time got that. but Abita. <laughs> it is a little controversial, and, but no, no, I see. Her superstar <laughs> are two cast record, like two shows I can listen to constantly. I love Avita, even the Madonna version. That is true love then, I think. <laughs> I was raised on it. <laughs> um, a favorite costume you've worn? Ooh. Oh God, there have been so many. I was, I played an, an earthworm one time at Young People's Theater and uh, it was the cutest, it was like a onesie, but it was like puff jacket style and it was an ombre, ombre pink and I wore this little pink beret and these teeny little pink glasses because he's blind and it was just, I felt fucking so cute. And I sang this song called <laughs> Plump and Juicy. And it was just like, it was so much fun. I, I, I remember feeling just adorable in that. Wow. And where is this Robin earthworm now? <laughs> <laughs> you can Google it. I look so cute. <laughs> Taryn, you can find it right here. Picture. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm like Jabba the Hutting on a piece of peach. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what show was it at Young People's Theater? James and the Giant Peach. Oh, fun. So that's cute. Mm. Oh, that's so funny. Um, a character you've played that's the most like you. Ooh. I would say mm, Dion's like the like inner me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I I played Horatio in Kronberg, uh, which was also a rock opera uh, about Hamlet. Uh, mm -hmm. And Horatio, uh, it was very much me. And it was a, a really freaking awesome sing. Um, yeah, that's probably closest to my personality. Um, ballad or anthem? An anthem ballad? <laughs> um, Ye, mm, I'd probably sing a ballad. Good choice. <laughs> no right answer, really, but okay. <laughs> Where is your favorite spot to sit in a theater? Ooh, front row balcony. We get so many of these, and we are like rear orchestra girlies. Yeah. So it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's just like, especially if you're going to see like, choreographed by like, I mean, Robin Calvert, Linda Garner, all the best. Mm -hmm. I I know that they have like the, the, the group like orientations and all the different like formations that the dancers have. I'm like, I want to see it from above because I just yeah. know it's going to be spectacular. Um, it's interesting. I think that a lot of performers that we've had on do say front balcony. Well, because performers play up. So right. They're like, don't be too close. Do not come too close. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of spit in this show. Just <laughs> warning. <laughs> well, this is the thing. You know, we were both in the last row at your show and also in the second row. <laughs> yeah. So you can't really, like, get too high away. <laughs> gotcha. um, yeah. Um, favorite show that you've never seen? Hmm. Light in the Piazza. Mm, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's a lie. I saw it at Musical Stage. Wow. Uh, Little Night Music. Okay. Oh. 
also beautiful. Another sun sign. Sun time again. Sun time again. <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> I'm so typical. <laughs> um, a go-to, what is your go-to karaoke song? Ooh, Somebody to Love, Queen. Great, so good. Um, favorite score? West Side Story. Okay, if you were to step into a theater tomorrow, which previous role could you still perform? Ooh. Um, wow, good question. Dion, no, uh, <laughs> no, I would hope. Probably, I would hope. probably Peter in Jesus Christ Superstar. I think I know it. And yeah. go, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know him, I don't know him. <laughs> um, and then finally, a guilty pleasure musical. Ooh, Phantom of the Opera. I knew this uh, was going here. <laughs> and Cats. Oh, a double ALW. Kelsey Brazotti. That's her favorite musical. Trivia. <laughs> she, not, she's not even guilty about it. She's up front about no, it. <laughs> I know. She choreographed her dance critique in at Sheridan to the Jellico Ball. <laughs> were you were you the same year? No, we were, I think Kelsey was two years below me. Okay. Or or I may have just left and she was there. Yeah. Because we know some people like around. We've, mm -hmm. we've actually spoken to a lot of Sheridan alumni on this podcast, which is very fun. Um, okay, great. Well, before we wrap up, we asked you to come prepared with an obsession of the week. So it's now time for our obsession of the week. Steph and I will go first, and then we will come to you. We have the same obsession this week, and we are sticking with Canadian theater. And Steph, what are we obsessed with this week? Um, we just got the chance a couple weeks ago to see Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 at Crow's Theater, and that is what we're obsessed with this week. Um, the gift that keeps on giving. They it keep extending. Extend <laughs> we laugh every time, but we're so happy for them. We're so excited. <laughs> It's it's only good for Canadian theater. Absolutely, it is so absolutely. freaking great to see. And what a great mm -hmm. cast. Oh, crap. Yes. Yes. When this did you get a chance to see it? Did you get a chance to see it? I haven't yet. Okay. I'm hoping because it extended, I think, to the mm, I don't know. March anyway, 3rd. It's, March 3rd. It's, it's your closing right day. Now. I know. Oh. Um so maybe it's nice. gotta extend one more time. Yeah, one more <laughs> one more week. Um come on, come on Natasha. <laughs> we were so surprised by this um, entire production. I feel like this had been teased for so long. We had been like anticipating it for so many years. Obviously a pandemic happened. And then to be at Crows and see the magic that they were able to put on was kind of similarly to like Dion in the, in the fact of like, wow, we have some really talented people here in Canada, in Toronto specifically. And it's so exciting to like step back from the big name player production companies and see these smaller um, houses and really get to support our Canadian actors that way. It was so good. And so as you were saying, they've extended okay. like nine times. So <laughs> exciting for the industry um, as well. <laughs> Yeah, our, t our country is full of, like, star power. And uh, it's exciting to see it starting to be recognized. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, my favorite moment, I don't know if Trevor, you have a different moment, the whole, like, abduction sequence in the second act. It's like a full ensemble party. They're picking people out of the audience, dancing with them, um, you know, sitting down, like quiet moments, loud moments. It's just kind of like a 15 minute sequence that is just crazy and so exciting. I was like laughing with so much, how much joy I was feeling in that moment. Um, and I just, just the staging, uh, it's always not interesting is not the word, but with the, with smaller companies, like with Coal Mine and Dion and with this year, I'm always struck with how much they're able to do, um, within the constraints of space. What I'm sure is budget, I don't know, but what I'm sure is budget. Um, For sure. It's like smaller, <laughs> small, <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, smaller ensembles, because I know on Broadway, this was like a huge ensemble and it's just like much less people and to still make it feel like so grand, so expensive. Um, every choice seems to be like 
so creative and is adding to the storytelling um, out of necessity because they do not have the not having the money to do it in you know right. the expected or bold way. It always makes me just so excited to see. Um, yeah, Great Comet was like a perfect example. One of my friends said that it felt like every like the performance that they saw was as if it was the final performance, and I feel the exact same way. The energy in that room was like a farewell performance, and it was a random Friday night, and they've extended three weeks later than what we saw it. So to have that energy is, it's just so, it's so nice to see and what a way to like start off the beginning of this year with such a great show. So that's our obsession this week. Jacob, what's your obsession this week? Well, <clears throat> I'm always at an 11. I have four Aries placements. So like anything I do, I, it's with an obsessive uh, energy, but I've mentioned Game of Thrones a lot. It's really the same. <laughs> and I'm all done. Fire and blood. Wow. wow. History of the Targaryen lineage. And uh, it's written like <laughs> I'm such a dork. No, but I like love Game it. of Thrones, anything I've, besides theater, that I've ever really nerded out about, like I have a dragon's egg. Wow. Um, Amazing. Like it's, anyway, but uh, yeah, I'm almost done and i read it every day on my way to work um on the subway which is like 45 minutes where i just get to read and it's written like a history book which is kind of fun because then the show uh mm -hmm. has kind of yeah. show what actually happened so it's like and I, I listen to podcasts and stuff that dissect things <laughs> dork, dork, dork. <laughs> <laughs> that's my obsession of the week <laughs> It's a good obsession. It's a, it's good a obsession. great obsession. No, I did. You see the commercial for the new House of Dragons se uh, season during the Super Bowl sure last did. night. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure and we have one more question for you while we're here. Speaking of last night, did you see the Wicked trailer? Um. Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk about it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That um that battle cry by Cynthia Revo. <laughs> I tell you, my nipples could etch diamond. I <laughs> like. I'm gonna be weeping in that theater. Are you a wicked you know fan? I first changed, and foremost, I changed my answer. Wicked is my road trip. Wow. Okay. Wicked. Soundtrack. Great. Wicked is so good. Opening night. This they're gonna do it well. Do you think? We're so I was very, very skeptical about this casting um, because obviously Ariana Grande is Ariana Grande and Cynthia Revo is Cynthia Revo. And I was afraid that we wouldn't be able to like hide the superstar of Ariana. And also, there is quite an age difference between the two of them. But watching that trailer mm -hmm. last night, I was like, Ariana girl, you look so good. Like, she looks so beautiful as Glinda. This movie uh, looks so expensive. And the, I don't the know. Practical sets. The practical sets. Also, I'm, um, I don't know if you've heard any of like the background, like in the back, people were filming them recording it. Yes, yes, and we've seen that. We've seen that. We've, we've seen, seen, seen that. Good, many videos. Oh, goodness knows, or whatever, or no one yes. mourns we, the we, wicked. We've, we've, we've watched them all. Yes. No, she sounds amazing. She sounds amazing. Okay. Oh, I went, okay. Hated her as Penny in Hairspray. Mm. She's learned to enunciate. Didn't I it, really think. It was just kind of like, oh, like Ariana Grande. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> but she got her start in theater. So yeah. I, I trust I trust her. I think she's going to be great. I, I think she feels really strongly about doing a good job. So I, yeah. I'm with Care her. Deep. Yeah. Yes. But she and looks I mean, like an so elf. Beautiful. Like the costumes. Beautiful. So I love beautiful. that they kept her, I love that they kept her brown eyes. Yes, I was also I so uh, like every like everybody else. I watched the trailer and then I proceeded to watch it frame by frame because <laughs> obviously. Yeah. And when I watched it frame by frame, I noticed that Cynthia has micro braids, which is incredible for that oh, character goodness. to finally like truly be represented in in such a way that I think she was originally written. Wicked means a lot to me, so I feel yeah, like I need to the lower wicked. my expectations Damn. when I walk into this movie or I'll be disappointed. And then we'll have to wait a year for part two. So do you think know. there were shots from part two in this trailer? Or do you think it was all part one? Yeah, no, I think there were. Uh, yeah. Well, Dorothy would be Dorothy. 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 Dor
And, and the, I don't know if it was Fiero. And I think it's like before she sings, I'm not that girl, like in the four, in the, when the whole yeah, lion I was thing. Like, happens, do you think that's like the like lion scene? The like the free the lion? Yeah. I think maybe he's that's got, he's got like a cut. He's got like a cut. Yeah. 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 There's also uh-huh. a scene I, in, go ahead. No, 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 go. Oh, there's also a scene in the trailer of like the two of them sitting together, uh, Glinda and Alphaba with like poppies in the background. I was like, this is a new song. We don't have this scene in the musical. This has got to be a new song. Mm. Or it's right before One Short Day uh, because mm. the Emerald City is at right after the poppy field, right? So maybe it's mm. them seeing the Emerald City for the first time. Okay, so you've done your wicked research also. Yes, we, we, well, I've, heard six, I've seen it six times and I've been a mega fan since 2003. So, I've seen yeah. it eight times. We're, we're, we're up there. <laughs> who's, your fa- who's your favorite Alphaba? Oh, wow. We should have played the Guess the Alphabas on this <laughs> we'll episode. Talk, we'll talk. <laughs> um, who's my favorite Alphaba? I can tell you my favorite Galinda hands down is is Kara Lindsay. We saw her do it in Toronto and she was ridiculous. Um, I love Jackie Burns. I love Jackie Burns, but forever in my heart, my first Alphaba, Stephanie J. Block, I'll never be over that. Yeah, and that like Megan Hilty too. So good. I, I feel like Megan Hilty made Glinda Glinda mm. in the way that, you know, like you see with musicals, you know, B.B. Newworth is Morticia, and so the Morticia's just B.B. Newworth. But then you see it on the second actor, and you go, oh, that's the character. Because anything Kristen Chenoweth does, that's just Kristen Chenoweth. Yes. But Megan Hilty was Glinda for me. Like her, her Thank Goodness, which is like the best song in the show. There are bridges you crossed, you didn't know you crossed. Yes, you we, we are Thank Goodness stands in the house. Okay, yes. It's the unsung hero and w- Wicked Witch of the East is so good too. Um, Steven Schwartz but, doesn't come up. Like, <laughs> yeah. About him. Uh, yeah, okay, anyway. <laughs> we can't go back. You gave your answers. <laughs> no, I did. Well, locked well, in. Thank you for- for participating in the in the wicked trailer um discussion, discussion discourse here, discourse um before we wrap this up where can people find you where can people find the show let's plug this show yeah so diana rock opera playing at coal mine theater till march 3rd and you can go to the coal mine website for tickets um yes our beautiful aha oh, you have one too Tara? Pamphlet <laughs> And uh, you can find me on Instagram at Jacob McInnis, M-A-C-I-N-N-I-S. Um, or I'm a visual artist. You can follow my visual art page, which is Jacob McInnis Art. Amazing. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Jacob. And you can subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can also watch us on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a comment. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at off 2 Way podcast with the number 2 or on TikTok at off to Broadway, also with the number two. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. And yeah, if you guys are all listening, go see Dion. It's on stage till March 3rd. And we can't wait to see what you do next. Woohoo! Thanks for having me. Bye.